Kia ora koutou. Uh, my name is Wendy. Um, I'm a student here at Lincoln University. And today I'm going to talk to you about the best bird in the world, kāroro. I might be slightly biased. Only slightly though. Right, so yeah, student here. Um, this would not be possible without a whole bunch of people. Who would have thought research could be fun? Right, so a little bit about kāroro. So they are large, they're the largest of the three girl species in New Zealand. Um, they are loud and bold and kind of bullies and bosses. And they're also lovely with serious attitude problems, but they are fabulous birds and far smarter than we give them credit for. So habitat and range, they're found pretty much everywhere throughout New Zealand, especially irrigated farmland and cropland, best buffets ever. Um, the rubber special, so they're the only native that is not protected under, under the Wildlife Act, except for spur-winged plovers, and they've only been in the country for about 100 years, so yeah, only original native not protected, which is super cool. And unfortunately, because of their attitude problems, um, they are causing issues, so they've done very well thanks to people, um, which is good for them, but not good for uh, other braided river species like the blackbird gulls and ribills and dotrels and all those other fabulous things. And yeah, they just kind of go gulp, gulp, gulp and nest gone. Right, so what do we know? So they, they're everywhere. Reciting records are kind of a bit interesting. Um, there was a group who did heaps of banding back in the day, which was awesome, um, but there are not very many that are banded now. And if you can't recite the bird, then you don't know where the bird has come from or where it's been. Um, so that's part of this research for transmitters. Um, so looking at the transmitters was where do they go and how far they're actually traveling. So do they have big home ranges, do they have small home ranges? Are they just kind of hanging out in a small area, but we just see them everywhere because there's so many of them? Or are they actually doing quite a bit of travel around the place? So thanks to ECAN, um, did a pilot study, which was awesome. So we just had 10 transmitters down the lower Hakateri, Ashburton River. Black-billed girls, Tarapuka, um, have a good breeding stronghold down on the Hakateri. Um, and unfortunately, they do get predated by kāroro. So kind of looking at where are the kāroro going? Are they specifically targeting Tarapuka or other birds? Or are they just going out to farmland? Where are they actually going? So from those results for the pilot study, um, so looking at distances, so yeah, colonies in the middle, on average, they kind of stuck within about a 10 kilometre radius of the colony, um, and the max was just short of 42. But that was because of Armio, one of our beautiful little girls. So her nest was at the top of the colony, down in the lower section, and she actually got flooded out partway through the season. But instead of Renesting downstream like 50 metres, 100 metres max, she decided to fly 35 kilometres upstream near Ashburton Forks because she could. Um, unfortunately, access is difficult up there, so I couldn't actually visit to see whether she had actually tried to renest, but she did return about six weeks later back down to the lower reaches down the bottom. So yeah, looking at distances. So um, the furthest distance in a day was 292 kilometers. That was Copperfield. Unfortunately, he went MIA, uh, missing in action. So we weren't able to determine whether that was a regular occurrence for him or whether he just decided to go on a massive adventure in the time he did have his unit on. You can see these kind of similarities, but also difference between the males and the females, which is super cool. I'm in habitat, because everyone wants to know this. So you can see super cool picture of the beautiful landscape. So the colony is down there. You can see where the birds are nesting along the riverbed. But what was really cool we noticed is that you get these beautiful little square pockets of birds. We're like, oh, they fit in like the beautiful fence lines, which is super cool. So um, yeah, really interesting. So much to unpack. But for all of the birds down at the Hakateri, it was always cropland, high-producing grassland, and the riverbed were their three main habitat preferences, um, as you can see there on the graph. And that was, yeah, for all the birds, male, female, whatever. And then, yeah, splitting up, still the same. But what's really, really cool is this ocean bias for the males. So the males tended to go out to the ocean a lot more than the females did. 
which was super interesting. And then we have Hagrid. He was our biggest boy. So he travelled out 20 kilometres out to sea. Um, as you can see, this, that's his data spaghetti, and the colony is there. Um, so he often went out to sea. Most of the birds kind of stuck within about a K, two Ks max um, of the shoreline. I did lots of coastal foraging, but he made quite a few trips out to sea. And 20 kilometres for a kind of more of a shore bird than an open seabird, I thought was quite a lot. So, super cool. So then thanks to more funding from DOC, um, we're able to get up to 40 units. So this was split between um, the Hakateri, so put another 10 units there, so we had 20 in total, and then 20 units on the Waimakariri River. So we've got the colonies here, so the Hakateri down there, and then for the Waimakariri, we split it between back in McLean's Island, but halfway at W1, which is also one of my breeding data colonies, and then up the top, um, just downstream from Woodstock. So we'll kind of spread that through a little bit more. So we'll just look at W1 for here, so the middle of the Waimakariri. So once again, that cropland, high-producing grassland, and the rock or gravel, which is basically the riverbed, um, were the top three for foraging preference, which is super cool. And no surprises, that was the same for all of the birds everywhere. So um, as I'm sure most of you know, uh, certainly, you know, through most of Canterbury, there's heaps of farming and obviously that increase in dairy farming, which Gabrielle was saying about earlier. Um, and yeah, they just love it. It's great. Beautiful buffet supermarket just on your doorstep. So it's quite interesting. So looking at the breeding season, um, most of the birds kind of stuck within a retrospective of their colony on their river system. But then in the non-breeding season, the birds are moved, which is super cool. So the Hakateri birds kind of ended up going from the Hakateri, the Ashburton, up to the Rakaia or down to the Rangitata. And so that's about 30, 35 kilometres max I'd kind of travel. And the W1 and McLean Island bird would stick. They're still just hanging around the Waimakariri because they can. But the Woodstock birds, which are up there, have all gone down to the Rakaia because they can. Minimum of 35 kilometres straight line flight from Woodstock to the top of the Rakaia and you kind of wind whistle and methven and then down the bottom it's about 65k so they're traveling a lot further post breeding season. So these are the four McLean's island birds um, so you can see their beautiful data spaghetti and they're all just kind of hanging out around the colony um, except for Egilus who decided that he was going to throw his toys post capture and head up to the, the Rakahuri. Um, where he's still just living his best girl life currently. So it'd be interesting to see if he comes back to the Waimakariri or not. But you can see there's definitely similarities, but then also kind of quite different patterns and preferences for the individuals, which I find super fascinating. I can talk about girls all day. And then we have the dude, super chilled boy. He was lovely. So he's also from Woodstock, the top. And you can see... He's kind of doing lots up there during breeding season. And then he's ended up down at the bottom of the Rakaia and heading between that kind of Ashburton Rakaia area down the bottom. And then we have Hanny Gull, also from Woodstock. So she's also gone down to the Rakaia, but she's kind of ended up using a different area. And one day she decided that she was going to head down to the Orari and then head back to the Rakaia. So that's about 105 kilometres from her breeding colony, which is a lot further than anyone else has really travelled. So it's yet to be determined whether this is a foothills bird thing or whether this is just them. That's just where the colony goes. They all head down to the Rakaia and wherever else they want for the non-breeding season. Hopefully I can find it out. It's super cool. And then another one of our beautiful Woodstock birds, Tag. So you can see here, 28th of January, she was hanging out at the colony and going out and feeding and doing her gal thing. And then 6th of February, she made her trip down to Bar Hill on the Rakai River, which is just upstream from Rakai Township. And then sometime between then and the 10th of February, she decided to go back to the colony. So it's around about, I think it's about 45 kilometres straight line flight, which obviously they never do because the gals. Um, so, yeah, doing good distances. 
And then by the 24th of February, she's down to the bottom of the Rakaia where she's been hanging out ever since. Um, and she also made a trip to Tiwai Hora on the 30th of April because she could. And then she's just gone back um, to the bottom of the Rakaia. So they're moving around quite a lot, some more than others. Cool. So in summary, so yeah, looked at distances um, with obviously lots more data, um, still ongoing for that, um, but definitely similarities between individuals and colonies, um, but definitely some differences. And then you have those top three habitats, so that cropland, the grassland, and our uh, high-producing grassland and the riverbed are definitely their main three, um, their main three foraging preferences, and that's here for all of them across the board, and then just a little bit of variation for those minor places. And yeah, as much as there are similarities, there's also differences um, between colonies and also a little bit between individuals as well. Cool, thank you very much. They definitely like eating on those riffles. So yeah, either for fish or... Yeah. They are super smart. I've had issues catching them because they're too smart. Um, but yeah, they'll pretty much, if they can fit it in their mouth, they'll eat it. So pretty much whatever's available. There are lots of big gulls that are known for specialist predators. So yeah, you'll get a small number of individuals that work out a certain system that might specifically go into, yeah, turn colonies and that's what they do. And so you'll have a small number of birds doing the most predation, um, which is really common among big girls. They love both, from my understanding. So if they're getting ploughed, they're in there. Um, if they've just been harvested, I've often seen them in those as well. And if the irrigator's on, all the, all the grubbies and worms and stuff come to the surface. So I often see them, irrigators on, they're in there. Yeah, I'm not quite sure how that would work with how much water you need to grow the grass or the crop and then how much you'd need for that's not my area of specialty but that would be a really cool thing to can you find the perfect match where you're discouraging gulls but still growing stuff oh that's like a mega conversation so exciting so i'm just like oh. um no, no no it's all good um so second summer coming into second winter now for tagging um so the pilot birds all went back to their breeding colonies. Um, and from what I found in literature, they're quite strong, unless they fail or repeatedly fail in a colony, then they'll go, okay, this clearly isn't a good place to breed and they'll move elsewhere. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see what the Waimakariri birds do this coming spring, whether they all come back or some come back and some don't, just to help confirm that. I would love to get units on juveniles, but I think that's more of a postdoc than a PhD thing, sadly. But yeah, my understanding is that they usually at least come back to check out their natal colony, but they may or may not decide to breed there. But that is yet to be confirmed, but that's my understanding through literature of other large girls. But yeah, yet to be discovered. No idea. But that's an excellent question. Well, they are mammals, so they do have to eat more regularly than cold-blooded things. But, yeah, we just can't see the food that they go for or they know the secret spots that we can't necessarily see. But, yeah, no idea when they actually have to have a food, like regularity of when they have to have it. But, yeah. yeah. Some of the birds we've caught have been fairly chonky, so... I think, like us, they definitely, you know, know how to pack it on if they've got enough food supply. 